West Cork is distinctly unique with its rugged beauty and mountainous terrain. The Atlantic Ocean etches away at the coast, carving out three distinct peninsulas. A series of remote towns, fishing villages and long abandoned castles punctuate the wild landscape. It seems therefore unlikely to be the location for a murder, but that's exactly what happened on the Mizzen Peninsula 25 years ago this Christmas. For the harbour village of Skull, with a population of less than 600 at the time, it was a transformative event. This is the house where Sophie Toscan de Plantier, a French television producer, was found murdered just before Christmas 1996. Nobody was ever charged in connection with the crime, and it remains one of the most divisive and enthralling mysteries in the nation. The case has garnered renewed interest through its coverage in the West Cork podcast and more recent TV documentaries. Only one man was arrested in relation to the case, but was never charged. I travelled to West Cork to meet with Ian Bailey to help me understand his unique perspective on the case, the media attention surrounding him, and what it's like to live your life under a cloud of suspicion. He's currently writing his third collection of poems, an exercise, he tells me, which he finds quite cathartic. He had brought with him a copy of one of his other books, A John Wayne State of Mind, I thought it as good a place as any to start in a story that spans 25 years, so began by asking how he came up with the name for his second collection of poems. I was sat outside this warm, lovely spring morning somewhere, and I knew in 19, 2019, I knew my worst fears were coming to, to pass, and the worst fears were that I was going to be tried in, in Paris uh, for a murder I had nothing to do with and that I'd always protested and I still protest my innocence and I will to my dying day. Um, and it was early in the year and I thought that the trial I think was set for April, May, yeah May, and I was just thinking to myself and I thought I'm going to have to really toughen up to deal with this, this is going to be something like I've never ever had to deal with. And I just mm, was jokingly thinking and I thought um, there's a place in West Cork where Maureen O'Hara, the famous actress, used to live, who was in the, the film The Quiet Man with, with John Wayne. And I just thought one line, I've got to have to toughen up. I better, I better sort of adopt a John Wayne state of mind. So Very that good. became a metaphor for, if you like, a psychological metal jacket to, so, to protect me. And then... Um, so does that jacket have to be worn frequently, or do yeah? You feel well, I think so. Um, you can, yeah. No, I think yeah. Well, sometimes it, <laughs> it depends on on the, the people in my situation and circumstance. Um, actually, while I was being tortured in Paris, I was being bonfired on a pyre of lies. I was actually writing. I was I was using poetry as a way of dealing with the the you know the. Uh, the, the, the dark bad stuff that was going on that I couldn't do anything about and so I, I used poetry as a way of if you like um, yeah cathartic uh, yeah. creative expression I was curious how Ian who was born in Manchester and was working in London at the time ended up in this remote part of the world he told me how he visited the east coast of Ireland throughout the late 1980s before ultimately coming to West Cork in 1991 so, so I came to a point where I was just getting tired and I noticed in London, I was between London and the Cotswolds, that most of my friends uh, in London were, were Irish people. Um, and I finished up in Irish bars and surrounded by Irish people and they always seemed to me to be slightly cleverer than a lot of English people. They'd know a lot of what the English people knew but they also knew an awful lot more. We, so I seemed to get on fine and, and I made... Describe that as crafty? Not necessarily crafty, but quite clever. clever. I think just clever, you know. Um, and then, so I had friends. I came over to Ireland in 1986 initially to meet a man called Pat Murphy. He's a legendary uh, former Fleet Street correspondent. And then I went back to London and I came over on another couple of trips on the East Coast, Arkley and Dublin, and met friends there. And then eventually I thought, well, I... I I had a friend in West Cork who said I could use their their little holiday cottage 
isolated it as a sort of base initially. And um, I did. Like, so I came over in 1991, Midsummer's Day. In, in a West Cork way, you mentioned that you were leaving a situation in the UK that seemed quite obscene. And well, yeah, I mean, I just got tired, tired of it, the place. I just got, um, I, I mean, to me, the writing was on the wall. And I think what's happened recent, more recently with say, do Brexit. You think, do you think things have improved? Since no, I, well, I don't know, but I don't think so. I mean, I just think there's too many people. Too many people? I think it's like 65 million people. How many have we got here? We've got five and a half million on the whole island. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's like, and you struggle very hard to get in on like in the rat race, you know, in Fleet Street and... It's very competitive and it's quite a lot of backstabbing. And, um, so I came over here and I had a sort of game plan and I, I made myself known to local newspapers, the Examiner and the Southern Star in Skibbereen, and started writing articles and doing any other jobs I could. And I finished up the first year. I, I had friends up in Dublin and I went up to see them and I was doing an odd casual labor and painting sea stones and making brooches out of out of little stones I found on beaches. Um, and then I finished up working on a farm in Waterford at the Shanahan's of uh, Fuse near Kilmac Thomas in from, I guess, I suppose, late September through September, October, maybe into November. Um, and I was, basically I was hired there as a, as a Spalpine Farnack, um, you know, the wandering, uh, the wandering sort of, min not minstrel, but labourer, but I was hired as a, in effect, as a human scarecrow. And at the time, Will, the son of um, Jimmy, the, the capo of the farm, um, said, oh, well, we want you to go out. And they had 150 acres of barley, and it was coming up to ripening. Ten months it had taken to grow the barley. And then the crows were coming in to eat huge flocks of crows, like not hundreds, not thousands, but maybe ten or twenty thousand crows were coming into a field. And there was so a, it sounds a, very hitchcock and yeah, It was, like the birds. Yeah. You know, one, there'd be one initially, and then there'd be two, and then there'd be a little more. So I went out, my job was to basically use the shotgun to keep the, the crows from flattening the barley. So I'd get up with the sun and walk the farm, and, and then I finished up writing a, a, power, a well, what turned out to be a poetic trilogy uh, called the Prey Khan, the Prey Khan Trilogy. Crow trilogy about the, the farming and the crow and the relationship between the land and the, um, and then do you have that poem here? Yeah, I do. It's in my first book. The um, I'll give you a bit of it. It's quite a long poem. It's, it's a, a trilogy, but it's um, so the first verse is it's called the Golden Fields of Kilmac Thomas. So low fly the crows of plunder in the shadow of the Thunder Mountain. And gold is the blanket on the ground midst the valley of Kilmac Thomas. With gun in hand, I wait alone in piney cops, the plunderer of the corn to catch, who swoops and dies from dawn to dusk to eat the barley to the husk. And then, so I wrote that, and I went back to the farm and wrote it out and showed it. And they said, when, when did we do that? I said, well, I wrote it today while I was out. And then I wrote The Farmer. So I take the farmer's perspective. I am the farmer of the barley, and like a shepherd shields his flock, so I try to save my stock firm on golden wad of straw, heads of sun-baked grain. For nine long months now, through wind and rain and storm and hail, I've nursed my crop with fatherly care, and now the time it has arrived. Within a month I'll know if I survived another year of blood-red toil to live and work upon the soil. And I'll be damned to see my bounty bloat the belly of the blackbird, grain grey scavengers of my pastures. I'll not have them. Would you pass up my cartridges? Anyway, then that tells the story of the... And then to... The, the, this was a sort of muse poem. I wasn't consciously... This it, was, it was just sort of coming out. This was back in the, in the 90s when you first... 1991, yeah, you, yeah. And the final part was the crow. And he says, I am the crow, Corvus in the Latin, Precon in the Gale, the plunder of black of barley gold. I soup and die from dawn to dusk to eat this wondrous crop to us. And then that tells the story of the crow. Um, so I was there for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, and then I came down to, winter was coming. I had a chance of going on a fishing boat out of uh, Tremor. And I was thinking about that as a possibility. And then I came back, I needed my winter coat, my long black winter coat. So I came back down to Skull. Um, I had left my, some clothes and things in store to get, ostensibly, my winter clothes. And then I found work in Skull at the fish plant.
um, which then was was processing herring for the Japanese market. And um, the Irish herring in Japan is pretty. Well, it wasn't the the herring. It was the flat. It was the it was the if you like the herring caviar. Oh. The eggs from the female of the herring. Um, they weren't after the, the actual fish. They were after the, the female, you know, caviar, herring quite caviar. Quite a delicacy then. Yeah, and hugely expensive uh, over there. So, and then I found work at the fish plant, and I worked the winter there. And I wrote a poem there, Erin's Herring, about the, the whole thing, about uh, in November of each year, herring shells are plenty to flow up. Erin's southwest rugged coast with coats of silver blue and eyes of red, a cade million, a cade million of herring fish from sea and dumped down dead. And on the land, an army of men and women wait to see the Iask off the boats, into bins, down the hatches, slit their throats and process catches. Here they come, boys, stub out those fags, stand back in awe and watch the slaughter. And if the man from Tokyo says yes to bellies full of gold, then Christmas time will be less cold. And Christmas time will be less cold. But many is the day when the gale of blow on the fishing boat she does not go, leaving workers, some with families, to curse their dependence upon those shoals. And on those days, in smoky huddles, you might observe the herring boys and girls ease their troubles over pints of black beer and the paddy, or wicked paddy. So that's the whiskey, by the way. Uh, so we'll curse, so we'll, we'll curse, the, uh, curse the lack of a cursed pay, hoping that tomorrow will bring a hundred million silver things to keep us busy upon the land. Oh, great captain, would you lend a hand? So I wrote that. And so the, the idea was this, that I would, I'd, I'd pursue my journalistic career and I was writing articles for the Examiner and the Sun Star. On, on what mu 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 Well, music, music, musicians who were coming down. That was one of my specialities. I interviewed Ronnie Drew and a oh, number of them over the years and the Hot House Flowers, in fact, that was, but that was later on. Back in 1995, that was. So my idea was that I would, I'd work, I'd write poetry, and I'd, and then, uh, and then I did other jobs. I was involved with the Earthwatch, the environmental group, which is no longer. It was in Bantry. Um, I think it was actually before its time. It wasn't very well it received. Anything to do with environment here then, back in the 1990s, wasn't really very, very well received. Um, it wasn't being listened to and heeded. I mean, now we all know, don't we, about, yeah, you know, the what, 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 what's, now, what's, what's the number one priority in the world, you know, global warming and the, and the decarbonization. So they were ahead of their time. They were. What yeah. happened? Did it, did it become something else? I, th I think it, I don't know what happened to it. I think it just, it, 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 it's, I don't know, but it ceased to be. So anyway, so I did, I worked for them for, for a while for the magazine, and then I worked on a film project in Skibbereen, a community film project. Um, and then I went, I was always doing pieces and, you know, getting my hand in. And then eventually I went back to, to in effect, to self full-time self-employed journalism in 1996. And I was writing away, no shortage of stories. And then just before Christmas of 1996, 25 years ago now, there was an event that everybody that has left, it's like a, a long, long, dark shadow, um, a ghost of Christmas past, which you know, sort of comes to haunt not only myself, my ex-partner and the community and other people every year. And there was a murder, most foul, of a lady from France who it was said I knew, but I didn't know I didn't know her. Never, I wasn't introduced to her. I was the lead journalist at the time. I had a call from the Cork Examiner who put me onto the story initially. Uh, and then I was reporting away and then all of a sudden I was arrested and accused of a crime. The thing, so I, I, the thing, I, I committed a crime so I could become the reporter on it. That's just absolutely, you know, bizarre. And I had no shortage of stories. Um, so that that was the beginning of a twenty-five year period of what's really been torture, mm. on and off at different levels. And I was arrested in February, I think February the tenth, I think it was, of nineteen ninety-seven. And unbeknown to me, at the same time, my partner was arrested. She was told that I had admitted the crime, which I hadn't, never did. I admire your fortitude of not dwelling on these things because of everything that's happened. Yeah, well, the thing, I think one of the things I've learned is I used to, so I used to, one of the things I learned over the years was I, um, I learned how to wood carve. And uh, there's a picture there of me with my wood carvings. I, if, if you can keep the mind active and away from, you know, 
eating itself. Um, that's a picture that, so, I mean, I use various tech, t 25 years. The first 10 years were, well, I can remember, were, were pretty dark and I really didn't go out very much. I kept to myself. I kept as busy as I could working on the land. Um, and I, you know, became a sort of that, that prize, prize winning uh, parsnips. Those are, those are pretty big parsnips. They're pretty big parsnips, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, and no, no, you know, all organically grown. Um, uh, pumpkin in the background as well. Yeah, so this is around yeah. perhaps this, this, this would time. be around about this time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The, you can see, yeah, the, the pumpkin. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was one way of coping. And then in the 2000 and, when was 2007, I went up to UCC and applied to become a mature student of law. What uh, was the modus operandi for doing that? Well, uh, one, it was because my life had been consumed with matters to do with law. And I think actually maybe my solicitor, Frank Bottomer, or somebody actually suggested that, you know, I do this course and I investigated it and they accepted me. So I went up as a full-time student. You could do it part-time, but I've never found part-time. I, I do things I like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it properly. I found a little gaff near, near, the, um, near the college and I went up and I did three years, PCL, worked very hard, studied very hard, bought loads of law books when Were I could second hand. one of the people out causing ruckus during Freshers' no, Week? No, 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 <laughs> no. Well, right? no, the mature student doesn't do that. <laughs> the mature student has hopefully done that in his youth, you know, and got that out of his system. Um, so then I went on and I did a postgraduate in 2010 and 2011, I did a master's. And after five years, I graduated with three degrees of law. Um, Does you and that's, uh, Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that was in sort of happier times. Um, and there was one, right, so we get to this situation, I'm going to revert back now to 1996. So I get arrested, my identity is let out, I'm all over the newspapers. Come back, I'm told Jules doesn't want to see me. She's reluctantly accepted I'm the murderer, which was bollocks. Um, and various other things. And then um, I become the center. And my, journal, my career as a journalist at that particular point after the first arrest was pretty well over. When the, when the journalist becomes the subject matter of the story rather than the actual, you know, I mean, after the story, they're, they're... It's just by association, it's toxic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, so, uh, I, all right, after the first arrest, I was told I couldn't go back to the, the studio house where I was living and sleeping in my little office. Jules didn't want to see me, so I, I, I diverted the, the car to, the, uh, to a friend's house just outside Skibbereen, an artist now passed away, Russell Barrett. Now, Russell wasn't in, and this is about one o'clock in the morning when I'm being dropped off after 12 hours of being accused of something I had nothing to do with and protesting my innocence. So in the morning, there was a lodger in the house and he let me in I had, I, it was a room there and I slept in the room. And in the morning I got up for breakfast and a man came down as well. He was lodging at the house. And this is a photograph of the man who came down. And his name is Stephen Martin Graham or Graham Martin Stephen Graham. And it turned out that he was a former British Army squaddy and I, ha I was there for a night, two nights, and then I went, but I managed to get back through to Jules, and she said, I'm coming back to the prairie, and when I got back to the prairie, the place was under siege by media. Um, I gave a brief press conference just to get them rid of them, because I'm a media you know, operator, and I know, you know if you give them what, something, yeah. they'll go. If you, if you don't, they'll, they'll hound you. So on the St. Patrick's Day of that year, 1997, who should I see coming down the drive? And we live in a fairly, I used to live in a fairly isolated rural place, but this gentleman. And he sort of, hi, just happening to come by, and I knew immediately that he was a spy. I just innately knew that he was, um, he'd been, he wasn't randomly just dropping by to see me because he didn't really know me. Anyway, he came down and I think I sort of sent him away. And then he came back and then he told me a story and he told me how he'd been recruited by members of Ngarda Shirkana to get to know me and how they were hoping that he, they, he could get, persuade me or get me drunk or something to say that I had committed this crime. 
And he told me the whole story. And I recorded the, his account of it. And it turned out they were paying him money, cash, small sums of cash, buying him clothes. Was that and, what we call entrapment, uh, essentially? Yeah, right? well, yeah, that would have been, yeah, absolutely. And not only that, they were, they were supplying him with hashish. And some, he got subsequently contacted with Sunday World. They sent down a reporter with a photographer. The photographer searched Martin before, um, Martin Graham before he went to meet them. And then when he came back, he, he produced what was, and it's a photograph of this, so you can check it out online, um, what could have been a bar of chocolate in, in, in an evidence bag, but actually was a large slab of, of hashish, um, of which I, know I didn't see any or, or really know, know about too much. And uh, so, and he told me that they'd, be not, they'd offered him £5,000 at the time if he could deliver a statement to them which would allow them to um, send a, an amended file to the DPP which would lead to me being charged. Uh, now, he was hounded out of the country subsequently when they realised he'd, he'd been turned as a, in effect into a double agent. And he came over for the civil action. He's now passed away, bless him. He's in, one of the last people buried in Skull Graveyard. So, it, and you know, so that was 25 years ago. And what's happened since? Well, you know, I've taken various legal actions to try to clear my name. Some have not been successful. Some have been, you know, not exactly total failures. I was arrested on three occasions. So I was arrested again in 1997 on a trumped up uh, allegation that I'd somehow been interfering with a witness, which was a total nonsense. Um, so people were encouraged to make false statements against me. And this is covered in a document which is known as the 2001 DPP's critique of the whole case, in which the DPP go through the entirety of the guard of claim and file against me and completely rejects it as um, being foundationless. And points out the guards were actually were, were, were persuading people that I was the murderer. And, uh, was there something to do with the phone tappings as well, or they had? No, well, I could, no, that that came out subsequently because I took it. I then eventually we. I don't know why it took so long, and it was a pity it took so long. But I, t I took and I think Jules and myself. Well, we both took actions against the state uh, for wrongful arrest and various other torts, and. One of the, the outcomes of that was that during the, so we got a discovery order against the guards that is for anything that related to the case. Now a lot of it was blacked out and redacted or withheld and what they call legal, um, oh for legal reasons. But one of the things that came out of it was the fact that they had been secret taping of conversations at Bandon Barrack to do with this case specifically. And what then became known as abandoned tapes came out. And the abandoned tapes were about a hundred odd recordings of some very badly, um, you, some of them you could hear the guards saying, well, we're going to have to stitch him up. We're going to have to break jewels. And this is going to have to be cut out of this statement. And or we'll have to get that altered. And we'll have to get so-and-so to say this, that, and the other. So there were three different categories of calls. There were the calls from the media asking for, and they were recorded. And then there were the calls between certain detectives and Mar Martin Graham and Maria Farrell, who was another innocent victim who was drawn into this and was persuaded I was guilty, who made some sort of claim that she'd seen me in the early hours of the morning, walking west of walking towards Goleen, which was a, a complete and absolute nonsense. And, uh, it's it's incredible with all of this strategy laid up to try and you know paint this picture that you have you know gotten to this point because I, when I think to America I mean there's so many people who are in prison who are falsely yeah. accused or, yeah well I mean I'm I mean I'm looking I mean in another age or another place I'd probably be you know long dead you know um, you know and I have received odd over the years odd sort of threats and menace and. And this and the other, most recently, sort of threats and menace through, oh, I don't know, quite sure who, but even the president of France was there recently in Ireland, uh, Mr. Macron, Macron, is it, or Macron? Yes. And um, 
you know, was calling for, on the Irish state to, uh, what was it, extradite the condemned man, I think he referred to me as. You see, under French law, unlike our common law uh, statute-based uh, system, you are largely, it, it's a reverse of our, there's no, they say they've got a presumption, you've got a presumption of innocence, but that's just a fallacy. In, under French law, and it's a Bonaparte code, if you're accused, the only reason you're being accused is because you're guilty. So unless you can absolutely, totally show, you know, that it wasn't there, absolutely, no, you're, you're going to get convicted, mm. as was my case. And I mean, they're asking me to hand myself over to, for retrial under their system of, they've got to be joking. I know I wouldn't get, you know, it's, 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 so, it's, it's so, you know, by I'd have no chance at all. And, you know, I've been sentenced to 25 years now. I've, I've been suffering, and everybody else has been suffering the result of a dirty, rotten, stinking lie for 25 years. And now, you know, I'm 64 years old, and they're saying, go to France, and we'll put you in a nice cell and give you croissants for breakfast. Last year, there was a renewed public interest in The Extraordinary Case, which was fueled by two new series on Netflix and Sky. Ian told me how he had offered Jim Sheridan access, and so I was curious to know if he had watched the series Murder at the Cottage and what his thoughts were. The civil action, I remember it well. It was in November, November the 4th, I think was the first day in 2014. I was approached on that day, that week, by Jim Sheridan, a film director, and everybody knows him. And we got him well together, he was grand and he said he had an idea to make something, and I'd met another journalist called Donald McIntyre previously, investigative journalist, you know, from the famous McIntyres of the Bearer Peninsula, and he'd expressed the same sort of interest. So I, I, I said, well, why don't you talk together and maybe even put a film project together? So the story behind this is interesting because Jim then went to the BBC in London and spoke to Storyville, and the commissioning editor of Storyville, Kate Townsend, then commissioned a 90-minute documentary, self-standing doc documentary. Now, what happened then was that she was recruited to Netflix, and she took Jim's idea over to Netflix and then brought in another director, a man called Simon Chin, um, or producer, yeah, producer-director anyway, and basically, and as you see, you can't copyright an idea basically stole Jim's idea. They started up with a rival documentary. I undertook with Jim uh, to cooperate fully with anything he might require. I gave him all the files and I gave him sort of unlimited access to me over the, the years and I did some self, they gave me a, a phone camera and I did a bit of self-filming. And then Netflix come out and they're going to do this and they're trying to persuade me to do stuff. And I was actually conned into doing a, a little piece which I thought was going to be for a tease, which they finally used in their final production. And the, I always knew it was going to be biased because the French family were involved in it as part of the production team. So it was never going to be Jim's piece. I, I trusted him that he would be objective, um, not overly sympathetic to me necessarily, but just objective. But their, their project wasn't. And in the process of that, and I haven't, I saw so early this year, guess what? Sky. So then he, so he's got this film idea and he, he's got, where is he going to take it to? Well, he took it to Sky. And Sky backed it. Um, but his hands were really constrained by what they, he could say under um, UK uh, broadcast law and regulation. Well, Netflix were not governed by any controlling anybody, they could say pretty well anything they wanted, and there's very little redress the individual could have. Are you saying the, the objectivity of Jim's piece was due to the constraints of what he could say? Well, or? no, he was always going to be objective, but a lot of the things he wanted to say, I don't think he could say because of the, the constraints of the legislation to do with broadcasting. I mean, it's an area of law I'm not, I'm not expert in. So the, his came out first, and I saw the first couple of episodes, and it was, um, it was very sad, it made me sort of... It just sort of made me very sad. And I was sad for the victim, I was sad for my jewels, I was sad for myself. And so I thought, I'm not going to watch any more of this for now, and I haven't. And then the next Netflix came out a few weeks, two or three weeks later. And in it is a great big lie, a great big dirty, sinking, rotten lie told by the senior detective who's there saying, 
that um, he's the one who came to visit me just before the first arrest and told me he was going to put me in the frame, in effect. Um, his name is, he's still alive, Dermot Dwyer. He's in the Netflix uh, production. And the first thing he says is, because after my arrest, when I came back, I found my clothes and wardrobe had just been like rubbished and all my best clothes, my winter coat, my long dark coat taken. Then I got a list of inventory of the things that were taken, jeans and this, that and the other. And on the top of the list of the things taken is quite clearly a long dark coat. And I was seen on the Christmas Day swim in Skull, in a video that was shot quite clearly in a long dark coat and a nice fedora hat, which they took and trashed. And um, so in, in the Netflix, Dwyer says, I burnt the coat. And they get a woman to, who was staying over at the cottage at Christmas to say she saw a coat in a bucket. Absolute nonsense, absolute lies. Dirty, rotten, stinking lies. Was, and did you first just see that in the Netflix one? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I haven't seen the Netflix. Somebody sent me the clip. <coughs> but anybody... <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody hearing that, not knowing any of the background story, is likely to believe that. And it's total nonsense. You know, I and I never had an explanation of what happened to my long black coat. And I mean, you you may describe yourself or not as litigious. I mean, is there any point in pursuing Netflix? I don't know. The lawyers are looking at it at the moment. It's, it's very hard. It's very difficult, and you need an awful lot of money. I mean, this is this is one of the problems. And when the common man comes to fight the big, either the state, and I'm fighting two states in effect both France and Ireland, comes to take on big multinationals in American courts, you know, you're talking megabucks. And there's never any, you know, we know this, there's never any sort of guaranteeable result. So, Do you, do you think that there's some warmth ha having built towards you over the preceding years, you know, that the temperature has changed? Well, I think a lot of people who might have been in the he did it camp are now in the he didn't do it camp. What I did notice after the the, doc, uh, the, net, uh, the um, podcast came out was a whole load of young people who weren't even born when this happened were introduced to the story. And I started to notice in the marketplaces and just out about I got a lot of support from young young people. And more recently, I think I, I went, I was a social media virgin until, oh, oh what, three or four months ago now. <coughs> Excuse me, and I hadn't really planned it. What, it was just a bit of a... have you decided? Well, I, I, I started with, I, I somehow got, knocked Instagram off my thing there accidentally a few weeks ago, but I was, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm not really very clever when it comes to this stuff, but I got Facebook and Twitter and there are a number of trolls who've been trolling me and I really, really, it's, it's sort of almost childlike, pathetic things. It's quite clearly coordinated or some, there's some coordination between them. I have an idea who one or two were. I think I've outed one or two of them, but I've got a lot of supporters on Twitter who follow me, and they, they, they I've got these anonymous, well, I'm saying troll hunters and cyber bullying people who go after the cyber bullies who are some nice. people call them what do they call them? They call them um, keyboard, warriors. keyboard warriors. I call them keyboard fucking wankers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then you know, quite often. Recently, I've got this thing where people come up to me from lads come up from me from car and say, "Ion, Ion, can I get a selfie with you?" Um, I don't know if that's a you well, know not a north side or whether that's a Cork accent or not, but it sounds like it. I'm like, "Ion, can I get a selfie with you?" And I said, "Well, sure, you can, yeah, but it does help if you buy a copy of me book of poetry." Twenty-five years after the murder, this case continues to take many twists and turns. Ian was tried in absentia in France and was sentenced to 25 years. He remains a fugitive, having won a high court battle in Ireland against his extradition to France. On the anniversary of the case, I asked him what hopes he has for any future developments. I don't know, I would hope that somebody has the courage to just acknowledge it wasn't me. And there is, I mean, we learned from the, uh, actually it was in the French Rob, but we learned from the pod, last episode of the podcast, there was DNA, male DNA found on the, the body, a body, well, on a, a, an item of clothing, I think the boot. And that DNA clearly didn't match mine. And yet that seems to have been ignored completely. Um, Whose who's, was that drop of blood? 
that was on, you know, found on, on the body, on, on her clothing. Um, also, there was the case of a man who was um, a local man who was driving on Monday the 23rd of December 1996 from Goline in West Cork up to Cork City and he came he came by the road, he took the road through Doris, he was going on the, what we call the back road, the, uh, the Bantry Road to Cork rather than going on up through Skibbereen and, and Clon. And he was overtaken at about 7.30, his recollection is very strong to this day, by a car, a blue car, speeding away on a blind bend, almost caused him to crash. And he was very angry, because you would be. And he reported that then to the detectives who started the door-to-door inquiries on what would have been Christmas Eve, Tuesday the 24th. And he gave them details of that, Incident, and he gave him details of the car number plate he could remember. Now, I only became subsequently aware of this many, many years later when he gave a restatement to what was known as the MacAndrew uh, reinvestigation um, report, which um, I don't know. Um, and that's, that's never been answered. So the, the, it was interesting that he reported this to the guards on the Christmas Eve, and they were doing a general appeal for information, anything. And... Um, Yet there was never an appeal. So the guards were aware of the fact that this had been reported. That statement never went to the DPP. It wasn't included in the DPP file. It was buried, in other words. And there was never an appeal for a driver of a blue car or anybody who might have seen a blue car being driven strangely on on that morning. And I I find that very, very, you know, strange. And I, I, for many years, thought, well, could you say that the driver of the car was the murderer and in the same way that you couldn't absolutely say that they were you couldn't rule them out